All right, I think the clock has started. So thank you everybody for coming. This, just so everybody has it right, is the session on how to build a platform as a service for smart cities. Uh, I'm Smriti Sharma, I work for VirtuStream, which is a company of VMC. Um, and uh, my role there is uh, to build the big data cloud service for VirtuStream. I've been now with EMC for almost five and a half years, of which three and a half were at Pivotal, uh, and then about two years at EMC. And what we're gonna talk about, and, and you know, Keith is gonna introduce himself in just a couple of minutes, but just to give you a, a bit of a flair of what we're gonna talk about is a work that was done by the Brazil uh, Research, what we call as a center of excellence data center. Uh, a while ago, actually. And since then, the prototype that they built has extended into a whole lot of variety of use cases, particularly for smart cities. So for those of you who are working for companies who potentially have offices in um, EMEA or in Asia Pac um, or in some of the other countries outside of the US, what you might find is there is this notion of building smart city, which can encompass a lot of different things, but I was just last year, late in 2015, uh, a meeting with the government of India and different states, and, and they mentioned and the plan, the project they were working on was smart cities, and that was to be able to um, make efficiencies uh, introduced into daily lives of people uh, using I IoT technologies, using um, distributed computing uses in, using in-memory processing and a whole lot of other things that we're gonna talk about at a high level. So I'll let Keith introduce and kind of go through the early part of the presentation and we'll, we'll get into the architecture. Welcome, Keith Manthe, I'm a CTO in the Emerging Technology Division. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking uh, Hadoop, analytics and other types of things. So uh, probably sounds like a lot of sessions you guys have seen here in the last day or two. So from that standpoint, let's see, how do I advance? There we go. Um, there's actually a term, they refer to it as intelligent community, so I'm not quite sure how that relates to smart cities as far as who chose the semantics, but the concept there is how do you actually take data, opinions, facts, and start to carve out a better existence for people around predictable travel, around you know, predictable outcomes of how you do your life. Could it be power? Could it be public transportation? Could it be anything around how the city runs? And so there's actually a definition about the talk to have a better work-life existence, to save money, and to increase citizen participation. Now, from that standpoint, what are smart cities really about? Well, probably not a shock that you were at Hadoop Summit, and the concept of smart cities are all around using data and analytics to help improve the city you live in. And how are you doing that? Well, that is uh, basically spotting patterns. It's using a lot of analytics, it's using a lot of data, and it's figuring out the path forward. And the path forward isn't always as uh, straightforward as it sometimes seems. And so, uh, you know, the interesting thing is, how many people believe humans guess better than machines? We got a few. On the Brexit vote, you would be wrong. The machines beat Brexit. Um, but from that standpoint, the concept here is use data, don't guess what's going on. And so, you know, that probably resonates given that you're at Hadoop Summit. Now, for that standpoint, what are people trying to do? You know, besides being innovative, you know, efficient, seamless, safe. And, I mean, from that standpoint is when you show up for the bus, is the bus really going to be there? Or, if anybody's ever been to New York and sit on the Secaucus Junction, and the 2.30 bus comes in at 2.55, well, that doesn't help you get there, does it? And so from that standpoint, from you know, how do you actually build an environment where it's predictable? You know where things are. You know where the transportation is. You know where the safe areas are. You know what's going on in the city. And you know, as, uh, as many talked about, this was built by Rio. Rio may be in the news this summer for something. Hopefully it's not the Zika virus. Um, but it, the fact is they put a lot of this stuff in in preparation for the Olympics. People want to be safe, people want to be secure, people want to get to the events. And so from that standpoint, you know, implications to the city, you basically are empowering your citizens. You're, you're hoping to improve their life, create, develop, and reduce, you know, the impact. Does that make sense? Sounds easy, right? Yeah, okay, I get that one. Um, so, you know, 
really it's down to big data enables it. So we talk about a lot of things. You've got a lot of the historical data. You've probably seen some sessions here about that. You've also got a lot of new data. You know, would it be useful to a town to have someone sitting tweeting about a bus being late? That might be useful. Or something not working. That might be useful. And so you're also doing sensors, Internet of Things, telemetry, take your term, M to M if you're from uh, EMEA, which is the bus. How many people think their buses have sensors on them? I don't care what city you're, you live in, you probably do. They may not use them, but they have sensors in them. So from that standpoint, all the trains, all the cars, all the buses, all the mass transportation, all the lights, you know, all, everything has sensors. So how do you take all of that and collect it and what you basically do is you take all these nice little geo-distributed uh, things. Hopefully there's not drones flying around, but I love the video on there anyways. You know, who knows what the drones are taking pictures of, but that's a different problem. Um, but you've got all these different things. You've got traffic cams. You've got you know, facial recognition cams for security. Where is that going? Introduce challenge number one. What do you do with it? How do you store it? How do you standardize it? How do you put a taxonomy around it? How do you capture it? Problem two, what do you do with it once you get it? So how do you actually make any predictive outcomes around, I've just stored a petabyte worth of tweets. What does that buy me? And so, you know, from that standpoint, the, what are my outcome? What do I do with it once I've actually stored it, ingested it, built a taxonomy, and now I want to use it? And so there, there's your challenges, which is, you know, both of them are equally important. Both of them are equally problems. And so from that, I'll hand it over to uh, Smitty to talk a little bit about architecture. All right, so, can I talk? Um, and I should also mention the term platform as a service means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Now, as I go through the architecture, I'm going to mainly focus on what uh, we did as a prototype. However, that does not mean uh, components cannot be added or subtracted. Uh, I also work for VirtuStream, so I should mention that the term PaaS, platform as a service, in the context of service providers is basically allowing or uh, provisioning a platform for an end user so that they can manage the application layer to a certain degree, right? So uh, with that caveat, let me kind of um, talk about the guiding principles of this architecture that we first decided to go, uh, embark on this journey. Probably, I think it was late 2014, early 15. Uh, <clears throat> So we wanted to make sure this is going to be a collection of technologies that is open, uh, agile, right? So open standards, open source. Um, I'm, I mean, in this particular case, since we use Greenplum database, we also use ODPI compliant um, uh, Hadoop distribution. You know, both of those are considered open and agile in that regard. Um, as we built software around it and code around it, we wanted to make sure that this would be portable. So the same thing that could run on Greenplum should also be able to be ported to Hadoop in case a customer decided not to have Greenplum as one of their substrats. Um, modular and flexible from a you know, component perspective. So as I'll go through the slides here, you will notice that we do transformation of the data and then we do analytics in the data. And the two are mutually exclusive. There is dependencies, but they're totally mutually exclusive. So we made sure that as we build the blocks here, they're modular. Uh, extensible, certainly in that if you have an API that you would want to be consuming from this data set, either to a front-end application or to any other interface that you want to uh, take that to, whether it's monitoring, management, or anything else, you should be able to extend this platform. Uh, certainly analytics riv driven, because one of the use cases uh, that we will talk about is uh, predicting the time of a bus uh, from the point of view of what happens if, yeah, so th this is an application that I use on a regular basis. So for people who take public transport, you want to get an estimation of a given bus that arrives at a given time, for example. So that's one of the use cases that we'll talk about. And then finally, software defined. Uh, clearly this is EMC, so we, we eat our own dog food. So, or you will notice here that the components are software defined in that we have leveraged Greenplum. We have also tested stuff using um, uh, Isilon, uh, which is again software defined way of implementing things. Um, so those are sort of the guiding principle. Now that's not to say that uh, the proposal, so as I mentioned earlier before, this is something that we have proposed to a number of customers. Uh, I have one, one customer in beta who's testing it. Uh, their inclination was to use 
basically commodity servers, but with a software-defined application on it. And that's, again, something called Viper from EMC, right? So you could use different components, but fundamentally what they offer is software-defined nature of implementation. Okay, so at a high level, this is how the architecture looks like. Uh, if you start from the bottom of the slide going up north, you have data sources that in this particular case we um, had coming from as a, sec as a CSV text file, pretty standard stuff, right? Uh, from some databases as well as some JSON data. Now this is data which you can arguably say that this is something which is a tweet that you can put in a JSON format. So we ingested that using the Spring XD framework, uh, which is again a Java development framework, open source, owned by Pivotal EMC. And that we ingested into a Hadoop platform, which was Iceland in this case. So that's again modular as I said. Then depending upon the transformation and the data that we wanted to pull, we moved part of the data into Greenplum database. And there we sort of did transformation using Python libraries, which are embedded in Postgres. And Postgres is sort of the core database that Greenplum uses. So there's a dependency here, right? Now that's, again, that's one functionality. There are also customers of mine who actually do the transformation in Hadoop in Isilon itself. Um, but in this particular implementation, you know, Python libraries are used to do the transformation of the data coming out of CSVs and it gets ingested into the Greenplum database. Uh, so this, this collectively makes up the integration and transformation layer. And then on top of that, uh, I should also point out, from, from an integration perspective, all the analytics that was done, and we'll talk about two or three use cases, one of which was to calculate the distance and the estimated arrival time of a bus, right? So we use Levenstein um, uh, theorem, or I should say algorithm, to do the calculation of the Euclidean distance between two different locations of when the bus is coming or what the deviation is from their expected time of arrival. So that kind of calculation happened in Greenblum. Uh, and really the only reason for that was because Greenplum offered some modules which were already pre-built, some mach machine libraries that were pre-built to make that calculation easier. Otherwise, you would have had to write the whole thing either in Java or some other interface depending on your data format in Hadoop. Uh, and then from a visualization perspective, we decided to, in this case, build our own custom portal, right? So um, the custom portal was actually built in JavaScript uh, it extended the APIs so that we can expose that data and take it to any monitoring tool, uh, as well as um, ha had embed it was already embedding analytics reports uh, inside of that app. So just to get a little bit more detail, the front-end tool also allowed you to, uh, and by the way, as I mentioned before, since this was done in the Center of Excellence in Brazil, part of the content you will see here is Portuguese. So if anybody is Portuguese or can read Portuguese, <laughs> this would become easier. Um, however, think of it that just this allows you to define the interface for ingest, um, to load the files if you've already staged them somewhere and put them into um, Hadoop. The second layer, transformation, this is where you would do the cleaning, conversion, uh, kind of understand what data you want to see. So the data scientists worked uh, on, off of this data. So there was a development team who built the front end. The data scientists validated this was the right data they're going to use for building the analytics moving forward. Um, they also implemented some cleaning here and conversion, as I mentioned. The integration layer. So this is where you would correlate, you know, data coming from different locations. So there's the GIS data, which is what is stored in either um, an image file or it may be scalar converted into a CSV file. Uh, so that information along with the reference data associated with the buses. So again, this, think of it as a timetable that the government uh, publishes for the for the transportation network. So you look up between the two sets of data sets and uh, then do your analytics work around that. So this is the integration layer to, to do that reconciliation. All right, so again, getting a little bit more into the details here, the schema database is really the, sorry. This is really the input to the database and then we use some schema matching heuristics and algorithms to do that analysis. And the output is, in this particular situation, things like attribute mappings, which are semi-supervised um, or semi-optimized, if you will. Uh, in terms of the algorithm, as I said, Levenstein similarity was used to understand and compare distances between two points. 
as well as the cosine similarity. By no means, this is a mandate. Um, you could use any other algorithm that does a detection between two sites. Um, and this sort of brings everything together, right? From a visualization standpoint, again, this was built in JavaScript. So the goal of visualization was to make sure not only would you be able to uh, represent maps on your application, but also associate the progression and the trajectory of the bus or any other element that you want to represent. Um, for some of the customers that um, we've spoken to who want to do IoT-related work, IoT, for example, in the context of identifying how many sensors um, would you have in a given agriculture field, would have a similar concept where you take a GIS data, you represent it on uh, a front-end visualization, and then you postmark on top of that where my sensors are on the field. So the concept still stays the same. So this visualization layer exposed maps and graphs, uh, all the metrics and the KPIs depending on the use case, uh, and also possibly depending on the use case had the option of exploration and drilling down within this map and kind of get, you know, drill down essentially uh, as if you guys have used OLAP tools and get to the, the value that you're looking for. Um, so the API implementation, open data, this, so this is the other project. I think for, the, for, the, for those of you who have um, interacted with companies uh, out in the UK and, and it's increasingly becoming, becoming popular in the US, open data platform or the initiative of exposing all data for the purposes of the greater good of the community is a huge government project. And this is an extension of that as well. So you take the data which is from your transport, from your um, water department, from your you know, waste management or what have you, and then be able to expose it out to portals where end users can use that data in whichever uh, you know, creative way they might want to use. So this is how this, uh, this that is how uh, the open data API from this platform came into existence. Okay, so the use case that I've been referring to, <laughs> the transportation. Uh, this kind of gives you an overview of what we started with, right? Um, we have the available data. So in terms of sort of the scalar data is what I tend to call because you really don't have any vector information here. You have the data movement information for onboard devices, the lat long of where the bus is at a given point in time. Um, the date, you know, what is the, the particular bus line? Is it green, blue, yellow? You know, depending on the country you're in, and the bus ID. So this is the kind of information we uh, consume. The goal would be to predict the time of arrival at a given bus stop, right? So with that in mind, the things that we incorporated was how do you make sure that the GPS is precise and it's not just random? Um, and if there were any areas which were sort of spotty, how do you cover that, or how do you extrapolate the information around that? So the consumption of the data as it was given to us uh, would be a combination of two things. One, which is a reference data, as I mentioned before, which is really this, routes and bus stops, and you basically put it in a data lake. And data lake here is the notion of Hadoop and Greenplum database, the collective. It could be both, it could be either or. And then from the GPS, very confusing. Uh, so from the GPS point of view, the bus itself is, uh, has sensors on it. So you're basically using some kind of a streaming platform, whether it be Spark Streaming or Kafka or any of the other open source tools. Um, and in this case, because this was, again, an EMC project, we decided to use Gemfire. Uh, and actually, the word XD has become old now. Um, it's renamed as Gemfire. So Gemfire essentially allows you to uh, process data in memory on the fly and consumes data from a source and puts it into a sink. And that sink can be Hadoop, it could be also Greenplum database, or any other persistent device. So that was the architecture of consuming the data, and then now um, Keith is gonna cover some of the logic around the analysis. And I know this is late in the afternoon, so we thank you for still hanging with us. Um, so we're gonna do a little math. Anybody enjoy math? Not this late in the day. Not, okay, there you go, I hear you. Um, but I mean, in essence, what we're talking about is, you know, kind of like I talked about on a bus or a, a train today. Where is it today at this exact moment? What's the likelihood it's going to be on time? And what's the route it's going to take with the average time that it would take on any given day? To predict then, if I look at an app, when I'm going to be there. 
And so that was the ultimate goal was not just what the published route which is, which like I said, if anybody's been to New York knows that that's never really when the train or bus is gonna show up, but the ability to pull up a mobile device and say, you're there. And it's actually there. So what they've done is actually take the lat long of the bus, figure out, you know, consider each bus stop a node, knowing the distance between it, and you know, come up with a model. So from that standpoint, the goal is to find the average speed, which is based on time of day, given traffic, given where it currently is. So is it off of its current schedule? Is it ahead of its current schedule? So physically, you know, lat long, where is it? You know, default model is basically what's the estimated velocity for any given day. So likelihood it's going to be on time is X, but that takes into account averages. Then you've got to factor in what is today. So is there traffic based on today? And you know, the answer is if it's 30 minutes behind, I don't care how fast you're going to go, given traffic, you're never going to catch up. So what you need to do then is figure out what's the math for likelihood of when do I need to go show up to be on that bus versus when does the schedule really say I need to be there for that bus. And so what they've done is really used you know, a series of aggregates, history, and present to equate what the average is. Yeah? Great question. And I think some of that is, uh, you know, I love the fact that, you know, that's actually becoming very common nowadays. Because, you know, there's actually, I swear by ways, if anybody swears by ways, but, you know, user collected, crowdsourced, take your turn. But that's where a lot of that would come in you know, whether they catch that on Twitter or whether they have a public app that you can go in and say, it's occurred. So let me repeat the question just for the benefit of everybody else, unless of course they're sleeping. <laughs> so I think the question was, um, what happens if there is an accident on the way and how do you account for the arrival at the time, right? So uh, this, this, not just this data point, but the other data point that is missing is traffic in this mm -hmm. entire analysis, right? Uh, traffic changes by day, by time, by location, by a variety of other factors that are going on in that particular city at a given point in time. So part of it is, is you have to introduce trending over a period of time, gather that data, mm -hmm. and then superimpose that uh, trended information over to your live. So in other words, you model it, and uh, uh, you model it, then you score it, and then you execute it. That would be the normal progression of doing an analysis. And keep in mind, all these three steps you're having to do in a split second time, essentially. So these two, and maybe another slide after this, kind of covers the algorithm that was used, right? But that's just only a portion of the entire work that is done. Hope that helps. Yeah. Um, to that point, you know, like she described, you've got a you know, hybrid architecture. So you have a series of historicals. You can put it down to an average and to a time in a day. So for any given Wednesday at 4 in the afternoon, it would have this amount of traffic. There's one model. And then to your point, what happens exactly now? Which is, you know, that's the average. But it doesn't ever equate to what's happening physically right now. And so it's, that's the model, which is how do you weigh the balance of current conditions and expected norms? Because expected norms go out the window when there's an accident. Or if traffic's cleaned, which I don't know any city where traffic's really clean, um, at least not these days. And you know, so from here, basically the prediction is how do you actually figure out what is the route, what is the average speed, you know, based on all those conditions of what is actually something that you can achieve. So that would be, you know, the end goal is a map with a series of vectors based on averages. And, and you know, one of the things may be you may make it halfway around the slot based on physical location and averages, and then uh, an accident comes in. And you've basically blown your entire rest of the schedule. And that's where, you know, the, the, as she said, the split second adjustment comes in to say, you know, whether it comes from a crowdsourced information, whether it comes social media, some form, or another great way, there's a sensor on the bus that says the average speed is zero. And so from that standpoint, they may not know there's an accident, but they know the bus hasn't moved in three minutes. And so from that standpoint, you've got an accelerometer that's not moving. 
And so while they may, may not understand what you know, the cause is, they absolutely knew the bus hasn't moved. And so that's where you get into the, the fun equation of balancing current condition versus historical. But the desired outcome then is, based on that, based on you know, physical conditions now and averages, what's the likelihood it will finish its route on time at a given speed? And then from that standpoint, you know, the desired outcome here, as you equate it on a map, is the ability to pull up on a website and say predicted time at any given station. Of course, there's probably a fun analysis to go back and look, kind of like you do with airlines, that says what's the likelihood we hit every schedule on time? I'm sure that analysis looks very, very colorful. Uh, much like it does for any airline, any bus, any uh, train, you know, it's, you know, there's an uptime percentage probably for every route. And uh, mileage may vary depending on the route. No this issue. Oh. Um, now, from that standpoint, there's the concept of auditing. Back to, I just talked about the topic. How often does this really work? So the answer is when you go to plot the model of optimal schedule, achieve schedule. You know, how often, you know, that's where you can true up the model. You can account for, you know, regulation if you want and put some sort of regularized uh, variable in to say, we understand what the average is, we never hit it. We probably need to change the regularization so that likelihood is you add a, another 10 minutes of delay every time you put in the bus, just for the fact that you're never going to hit the time. And, you know, the average may say you do, but that's at 5 in the morning. At 4 in the afternoon, you never will. And so you need to, uh, to slot the model. And that's sort of the idea of auditing, where you come in and you try to figure out, you know, is, is it working? Is the schedule working? Or is the on-time percentage 10%? In which case, we need to tweak the model. So, so there are two aspects to this, to, just to add to Keith's point. Um, right? First of all, is not just auditing and sort of understanding the validity of the model that you're using. It could be done in a couple of ways. You run five different models, and then you take a standard deviation or a mean average percent error map, map if you will, and sort of compare map and a couple other kinds of errors. You know, have a good matrix, good old matrix, and understand what's the best algorithm to do. The other way to do auditing and understand if your model is right or wrong is that, well, is it actually doing, is the model, how, how much, what is the deviation between the actuality of the bus arriving at that same route versus what was predicted? So think of that as an audit of your model, right? So they, they, in this particular scenario, they did not do the comparison with different models. What they decided to do was do the audit and compare it to the actual real time. Make sense? Um, continue on. Yeah. So this is um, um, ah, this is an eye chart, but I guess you get the idea. <laughs> this, this, so the same auditing uh, process was actually exposed through the uh, interface. Now keep in mind uh, there are the user for the front end interface in this scenario are the city officials. Right? The city officials are keeping track of and. So far, we've talked about the bus routes and traffic and so on and so forth, but there's another angle to traffic management, and that is how frequently and how, what is the frequency between red lights, right? Do we need to change them? And there's a game going on versus not. So things of that nature. So this interface was meant to be a super user interface for the city officials who not only track the validity of your model, but are also able to then take this data and from an adaptive perspective, make some changes in their lighting scheme or any other scheme that might be relevant in that category. Okay, um, so this is the, the map that they would see, right? Route A, Route B, and then the bus GPS. So the bus GPS, which is green and uh, purple here, kind of tells you this is where the bus was. This was the real time uh, number. And Route A and Route B, are, are it's suggested or the estimated. And what's the deviation between the two? So they would see a pictorial, num a pictorial graph or a pictorial representation, and they would also see, uh, if they wanted to drill down into this, uh, basically a comparison in a table. OK. so. So, so far we've talked what Brazil team did, but as I said before, there are a number of other countries uh, who, you know, obviously EMC has federal customers, DOD customers, as well as a whole lot of other um, 
you know, global customers who have similar requirements. So over time, uh, so as I said, the project started in 2014, early 2015. Right, it has become much more mature. Uh, if you look at different layers from bottom to the top, from an infrastructure perspective, and I should also mention, you know, the word IoT <laughs> is being used now as if it was the best thing after sliced bread. But <laughs> beyond that, I think what we're talking about is no different than IoT. Right, you're gathering the information from the buses, their sensor data. That's what you would typically do. Uh, in fact, we just finished a project, uh, we as in the Virtue Stream team just finished a project of gathering sensor data from the tractors and doing an analysis of um, what is the prediction of sugarcane in a given field and what's the correlation between those tractors, harvesters, cultivators, as well as the vegetation, which is yet another angle, right? You're, you're basically processing images from the satellite. So the collection of all of that is simply data which is coming up from <coughs> devices, which are devices that will uh, that'll throw out information on a different protocol. So I think one of the uh, points which I think I thought about when you asked that question was how does the bus actually, how do you know that there is a, uh, traffic accident, right? So that's because the sensor is sending information, right? Now that information is typically communicated over a different protocol, uh, which is either radio frequency or MQM or some of the other unique protocols which are specific to the IoT industry. Low, I think, I believe it is low band, um, uh, low hertz uh, bandwidth, if you will, low band. Um, so, so, so essentially this is what the infrastructure layer consists of. Um, there is a city IoT infrastructure. They needed, they needed to make sure whether they are, uh, there are devices that have been installed on the red lights, at the intersections, as well as um, at the bus stops, on the buses, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole infrastructure that is associated to this. Um, so these are all the devices. Then from an infrastructure perspective, there is also where is the data stored, right? Not just an orchestration of how do you consume and how do you process the data, but is it stored in a distributed system or is it really in uh, you know, an SMP RDBMS <coughs> of the olden days. So that definition, whether it's structured, unstructured, what the format is best to consume it in, is it real time or not? You know, each of these can be blown up into a one hour discussion of their, of their own. But the point here that I'm trying to convey is that you have an infrastructure layer that needs to be already in place, <coughs> a, a data orchestration layer, which could be a combination of these technologies or each of these by themselves. Uh, there's a service enablement layer. How do you enrich the, the product? How do you enrich the data that you gathered? And then finally, how do you have a real-time representation of the data based on the customer needs? So it's a lot to consume in one slide, but um, you know, this is where sort of what we have built as a solution for our customer comes in. From an EMC perspective, in addition to saying that yes, as a customer you, who wants to do IoT analysis, you have to have your own IoT infrastructure, we also have storage um, a persistent uh, uh, constructs, if you will, in, by way of Isilon or Greenplum or some of the other tools that we have at which, based on which you're defining your infrastructure. So this is where uh, the storage comes in. You could virtualize this storage um, using SDN or you could also use VMware from a compute perspective. You have EMC storage in the back end. Um, in the middle, th this is where your data orchestration happens. It could happen either in, you know, we are here at the Hadoop Summit, so I can talk about processing data either using MapReduce or you could do Hive, HBase, so the same construct um, exists here. You could use an MPP, Massively Parallel Database, right? Uh, this could be Greenplum, this could be any other product of your own choice. Then you have some real-time products that also enhance your analytics capability and have, and are able to support an evolving schema which was unheard of uh, a couple of years, uh, 10 years back, right? <laughs> Since we are on the anniversary of 10 years of Hadoop. And then finally, from the application uh, exposure perspective, if you will, you know, you, from an application developer, you want to be able to build a platform where you can build applications in an agile fashion. So the word Cloud Foundry, for those of you who have heard it, is a development platform that allows you to build applications in an agile fashion. Now, that's not to say you don't need the other things, absolutely, you know, in some form and fashion, right? But the, the key is that can you keep a central repository of everything you've built? Um, either if you have used, um, let's say, I mean, R is really not integrated, but let's say if you have an anal analytics algorithm that you want to keep in a central place, 
Bibbidi Cloud Foundry would be useful. If you want to build a JavaScript and you want to expose that visualization layer, Bibbidi Cloud Foundry could be used for that. So this is sort of the stack, I would say, that is a superset of all the technologies that you could use. Um, and now, given that it is five more minutes left, this is a mini little informational on what Greenplum database is. So as I mentioned before, I uh, was a global CTO for Pivotal uh, about two and a half years ago. Greenplum was as a technology acquired by EMC. It's an MPB database, uh, so you have one table and you sort of shard it across a bunch of storage devices. And these storage devices are small servers, if you will, right? They're commodity servers, and you can put, uh, you can, out of a 10 terabyte table, you could put one terabyte in each one of those servers and then process it in parallel. So that's the power of distributed computing. It's highly scalable. You know, you can do in-database analytics. So instead of doing, um, or using one server that analyzes and does your logistic regression, you could distribute that logistic regression across all of those one terabyte data sets and then process it in parallel. Very powerful. So you're, you know, we have had customers who have uh, moved to this platform uh, from some of the traditional technologies and have seen you know, 20 to 50 times a fac factor of improvement, not percent, factor of improvement. And that is huge, right? Now, I'm not saying that you, know, you have to know where you start from before you know where you're going to go. So the 50x improvement could very well have been you know, attributed to the badly written SQL. So beyond that, though, the fact that the architecture is different, it's distributed computing, you will just get a lot of acceleration by that architecture. And then the other component that we used here was Isilon, which Keith will talk about. So if you haven't heard of Isilon, it's a scale-out NAS. We partner with Hortonworks. It, it has a native HDFS interface. It is actually you know, part of the separated separation of compute and storage which I found kind of interesting that one of our keynotes this morning was talking about disaggregating storage and compute. I love the concept. I couldn't have paid them any more to do it. Um, but from that standpoint, you know, it's how do you manage at scale? How do you grow? How do you get storage efficiency? We actually use erasure coding, which I enjoyed the LinkedIn session where they talked about erasure coding coming into Hadoop and how it actually will improve storage efficiency at the same time, keeping durability of storage and your data, you know, the ability to prevent data loss. So from our standpoint, we actually already support erasure coding. That is our method of distributed computing. So we also get the ability of storage utilization of 70 and 80% versus, say, 33%. So this is, uh, you know, a little bit of ice on. And, you know, from my standpoint, how do I do the math and why does, you know, why do we think this gets very interesting on things like telemetry? Well, from a Hadoop standpoint, Hadoop really doesn't like small files, for those of you that have played with it. And for those that don't know, for every file you put in, it takes a 1K in memory for the name node. So if I start to do a little math, and I start to say that I've got a name node that, you know, one of the large ones, maybe 512 gigabytes. Is that about what most people's name nodes are, or are they smaller than that? I'm getting impressions smaller than that. Um, so for every file, I get 1K. So basically, at most, I get 500 million files. Let's talk about Rio. They have 12.5 thousand sensors. Assuming I only take one every minute, that's only 18 million files a day. Most of these stream every 10 seconds. So basically, in Hadoop, one name node can capture about two days of data before it runs out of memory. Whoops. So what had tends to happen from our standpoint is we actually store the metadata for all the files on SSD, which means we can buy more SSD and scale it out. And so from our standpoint, that's you know, where we spend a lot of our time is understanding how can we provide the scale. Because when you start to get that many small files, it starts to get painful. And on that, we're almost out of time. Questions? Uh, how do we handle the IoT security sensors? Great question. Because there's a guy in the professor of Argentina who attacks all these smart uh, traffic lights. It's all the green, same time. Or very same, but same time. Is that okay? I absolutely agree that uh, having protection around IoT sensors is a requirement we're going to figure out how to solve. So you want to do this? Yeah. Not real, not real, not real. 
it, it's a real problem. Yeah. Um, no, it's we have not, that's one of their issues they still have. So. Yeah, and you know, from EMC's perspective, we typically, if it's an IoT device, that would be that would be more of a responsibility of the IoT device owner. But I would suspect, you know, since yeah, since it is a similar protocol as an IP and TCP, I, I would suspect at some point you will have a variation of things like SASL or SSL, some of those tools, some of those implementations rather. Thank you, guys. Any other questions? Thank you, guys, for sticking around. Mm -hmm.